What's up, everybody? I can already tell this is going to be a long one, so get comfortable. But I think this is the most important story in the OT because it's who some people trace their lineage back to. Allegedly, but we know what region Milikowski's from. Jacob is the one who God changed his name to he that wrestles with God and prevails or something, or is Rael. And Esau has been deemed their mortal enemies. But it was Jacob who stole everything from Esau. And it is amazing to watch Christian apologists, and that's a great name for it, because they constantly have to apologize for the acts of the Old Testament. But they do some mental jujitsu to explain how Esau is in the wrong and should be despised. They even make it into a cute, cuddly children's story. And if you're wondering why Esau looks like a little miniature Bigfoot here, well, we'll talk about that as well. For the record, anyone who might be new and don't know my take on this, I'm not saying anything bad about Jesus. But having been raised a Christian and struggling for, what, 35, 40 years of my life to reconcile the Old Testament God with the Father of Jesus, I finally came to the conclusion that the OT God is not the Father. I know some people still disagree wholeheartedly. Uh, thanks for sticking around. And I hope you go with whatever you think is right in your heart. Honestly, I don't have an ironclad belief in anything here. And, you know, two years from now, I may think differently. But I still haven't heard anybody explain how the Antichrist to the Christians is the Messiah to others. When it is undoubtedly the same person, whoever builds the third temple... But there's a lot more than just the one fact there that makes me think the way I do. This is exactly a hundred screenshots here, so we're going to summarize. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Isaac married Rebecca, and, and she has a brother named Laban who comes into the story later. I believe he lives up in modern-day Turkey. It took a long time for Rebecca to become pregnant, so Isaac prayed. She finally becomes pregnant and says, why is this happening to me? Her babies will f are fighting each other in the womb. So she goes to ask the Lord what's going on here. Now, to define that a little bit, really all we know is the Lord was one of the Elohim. Uh, the Hebrew here on that is El Shaddai, which translate as God Almighty, but it should really be looked at as the Almighty God, as in there's a lot of gods. That's the Elohim. I know this is famed for monotheism, but they straight up name other gods, other Elohim that are the gods of different cities. Later down the way, Yahweh introduces himself as the God of Israel, but I kind of don't think that that's the same God that was back in Isaac's time. If you're new here or you think I'm crazy and just don't know what I'm talking about here, check out my playlist, Yahweh the True God. And especially this video. Sorry, but I think Christians and Judeans alike have been fooled by all this. You know, there is no mention of spirituality or an afterlife or anything in the Torah. It is simply bow down and serve this thing that we call Yahweh, which is literally a G-sidal maniac. But like I said, I'm not sure if this El Shaddai is even the same God as Yahweh. And I'll just leave it at that for now. But this El Shaddai says... To Rebecca, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, what these gods always promise is wealth and power. Great nations will come from you. It's all worldly accomplishments and not spiritual in the least bit. But Yahweh tells Rebecca that the older will serve the younger. When it came time for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out and was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. So I've got a couple different thoughts on that. One of them is literally Bigfoot. As crazy as that sounds, it's not as crazy as it sounds. And another thought is the red-haired giants that have been reported worldwide, basically, even in America by the Native Americans. But you'll see that he is a big, strong hunter type. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Now, just 
think of the picture that paints in an allegorical sense. Custom dictates that the elder brother inherits everything. And here is Jacob, the younger twin, just clawing to beat Esau out, you know, grabbing him by the heel. And I got to play this clip here. Sorry, the audio sucks. The key to understanding this story of Jacob and Esau and that Jacob is not a deceiver here. That's a play on words is literally hand on heel. But hand on heel is can also mean deceiver. So it was a play on words when he's calling him that. It's the Bible's not calling him a deceiver. Yahweh said two nations are there. Two peoples will be separated. One will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. God said it. So hand on heel means deceiver, but that's not what it means here. I want to jump to the book of Malachi real quick where Yahweh Elohim is once again angry with the tribe and they're asking, how have you loved us? And he says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated and I've turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Now, custom dictates that the spoils go to the elder brother. So why did the true God of all creation decide to screw Esau over here? Yeah, yeah, I know every other elder brother gets this, but not you, man. For you, I'm going to give everything to your younger brother, and by give, I mean he's going to deceive you and steal everything, which we'll get to. But why would the true God do that to anybody? You know, you're not really supposed to love one kid more than the other, at least let him know. But Yahweh decides before Esau is ever even born that he doesn't like him. Why is that? Well, in the New Testament, Jesus tells the Yahwehians that they belong to their father, the devil, and there is no truth in him. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Maybe that has something to do with Yahweh favoring Jacob, a very deceitful little man here, as you will see. So Esau was a skillful hunter, man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. So, in other words, Jacob was a soft, spoiled, pampered son of, you know, favorite of Rebecca's. And they're not talking about a Coleman pop-up tent. We're talking carpeted plush pillows with exotic incense burning. Uh, It's hot in the desert, so you sleep all day and then drink wine all night and play music and dancers. So this is how I view Jacob in this situation. He's kind of the spoiled city kid, while Esau was possibly the Kandahar giant. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is also why he's called Edom, which later you'll get into the Edomites. Jacob, being the fine young man he is, says, okay, first sell me your birthright. Esau says, look, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob says, well, then starve or sell me your birthright. So Esau swore and finally got something to eat from his brother. And now he despises his birthright. So look, he was out hunting and he could have been gone for literally weeks at a time on this. He comes across his brother weak and literally about to expire. And Jacob says, no, you got to give me everything that you're going to inherit. Now, the Talmudic version of this, which I really wish I could find, but can't, but it says something along the lines of Jacob being clever in seizing the opportunity, because that's what family's for. When you're at your weakest and most vulnerable spot in life, then they steal everything that you have. And apologists ignore all of the deceit involved here and just say, yeah, well, he despised his birthright. That's not despising your birthright. That is having to decide between keeping all of your material wealth or just checking out on the spot here. But okay, Jacob steals Esau's birthright. Esau marries a Hittite woman, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to be like Jacob and marry your first cousin. Yahweh likes incest. Then when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his elder son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac tells him, look, I'm old and about to croak, so grab your bow and go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. 
then cook me up some tasty steaks so I can give you my blessing. So Esau lives to go hunting, and Rebecca had overheard all of this. She tells Jacob what's going on and says, Now listen, my son, go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can make some food for your father, so that he may give you his blessing. And then he says, My brother is a hairy man, and I have smooth skin, so what if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother says, well, let the curse fall on me. So he does it, then Rebecca cooks some food, and then she takes Esau's clothes and puts them on Jacob, and then she takes the goat skins and puts those on his neck and his hands. Jacob takes the food into his father and says, my father, yes, my son, who is it? I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac said, how did you find game so quickly? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. And then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. I'm a little suspicious already, I guess. So Jacob went close, his father touched him and says, well, the voice is of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Because he had the goat skins on, he's all hairy. And he says, are you really my son Esau? I am, Jacob replies. Okay, let's eat so I can give you my blessing. So he ate, drank some wine, he's feeling better. He said, come here, my son, give me a kiss. And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's rich richness and abundance of grain and new wine. Keep the wine flowing. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. And may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father and says, here, eat some of my game so that you can give me your blessing. Isaac says, who are you? And he answers, I'm your firstborn son, Esau. Trembling, Isaac says, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. This was back when a blessing actually meant something, and he had just bound his elder son to serve the younger. Esau cried out, Bless me too, my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau says, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? Which the name probably means something like the hand on heel thing. And he says, Well, is that the only blessing you have? You can't have a can't bless two people? And really, I think it has to do with you can't promise the same thing to two different people. And he kind of gave Jacob everything he could think of. Isaac says, I've made him Lord over you and all his relatives. Gave him all the food and all the good wine, so what can I possibly do for you? Again, Esau cries out, bless me too. So Isaac finally says, your dwelling will be away from earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother, but when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Esau held a grudge, I wonder why, and he says, The days of mourning of my father are near, then I will off my brother Jacob. So first, Jacob had found his brother in a vulnerable spot and made him swear away his birthright if he wanted to live. And I'm still yet to hear any apologist really acknowledge the deceit there other than like the guy earlier no i know his name means deceit but that's not what they mean here then he puts on his brother's clothes and wraps a goat skin around his neck to lie to his dying father and get his blessing and you can just see his conniving mother over in the background watching this all go down but they've done nothing wrong here because this is god's will he wanted there to be enmity between the two doesn't it just seem weird that God just doesn't even like Esau before he's born? And I know some would say it's because he knew he was going to be evil, but they don't mention anything evil that he did. And here's another take on this. Genesis chapter 33, verse 9, and Genesis chapter 36. 
So considering the context, God loving Jacob and hating Esau has nothing to do with the human emotions of love and hate. It has everything to do with God choosing one man and his descendants and rejecting another man and his descendants. So no, it has nothing to do with the human emotions of those words. It's just that God is a Jacob supremist. But I'm telling you, to this day, and even I watched a Christian guy earlier talking about Esau, saying that he is definitely a demon Nephilim whose bloodline needs to be eradicated from the earth. And I haven't seen the first thing that would indicate that he ever even did anything wrong. Jacob stole from him. Anyway, Rebecca starts worrying that Esau's gonna F Jacob up, so... She says, all right, you need to go up to, this is, I think, modern-day Turkey and stay with my brother Laban. Then some more supremacist attitude. I'm disgusted with living with these Hittite women. And they project this superiority complex onto other people. Right now, it's whites. They've convinced everybody that they've screwed up the whole world when, in reality, it's their usury system that we have today. And I forgot to mention that not only was Jacob a liar and a thief, but when Isaac asked him, how did you get game so fast? He says, well, the Lord, your God helped me. So he's also a blasphemer by their own standards. But Isaac forgave him long enough to tell him, uh, make sure you marry one of your cousins over there, your mother's brother's daughters. So Jacob left for his uncles and he goes to camp for the night puts his head down on a stone and has a dream which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching in heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And above it stood the Lord. And he says, I am the God of your father Abraham and of Isaac. And, you know, I stayed hidden from you the whole time you were living with Isaac. But now that you screwed him over and you're gone, we're cool. And I'm going to give you many descendants and they'll spread out all throughout the world, and, well, they'll be just like you. And I just find it interesting that this God picked a liar and a thief, and this isn't a redemption story. There's no redemption here at the end, and he, you know, turns over a good leaf. It would just appear that El Shaddai likes shady people. So after the dream, he says, surely this is the place of God, and he set up a pillar when they use the term pillar, what they really mean is an obelisk, a phallic symbol, and then poured oil all over it. Yeah. And then he swears to give a tenth of everything to God. We're going to breeze through some of this. Eventually, he runs across Rachel, his cousin. His uncle Laban finds out he's in town, so he comes to greet him. And after a month of him being around and helping out around the farm, he says, well, you know, you can't work for me for nothing. Tell me what your wages should be. Now, Laban has two daughters, Leah and the younger one, Rachel. And Jacob says, I'll work for you for seven years if you let me marry my youngest cousin, Rachel. And Laban says, well, better you than, I don't know, maybe not your cousin. <laughs> but the seven years fly by, Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete and I got that urge. So Laban brought everybody together for a feast, a big party, and when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. He must have been really trashed. He didn't even know who it was. Then he wakes up in the morning with Leah and says, what is this you've done to me? I've served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? But no, no, it's not deceit here, guys. It's not, there, there's no deceiving going on. This is the will of God, so there's no deceiving going on. But Laban just says, uh, it's fine, it's not our custom here to give away the younger daughter first. So I just lied to you for seven years, no big deal. But if you want to work another seven years, then you can have Rachel, the one that you wanted the whole time. And honestly, this doesn't sound like a family that anybody would want to hang out with. But they make a deal for another seven years, Jacob finally gets him some Rachel. So he starts having kids with Leah, Rachel can't get pregnant, and she finally says, well here, take my maidservant and knock her up. So Jacob says, okay, if you insist. So they start having kids that Rachel claims for her own. And then Leah stops having kids. So she takes her maidservant and says, here. So they're just passing around Jacob and his oiled pillar. Eventually they're paying each other with mandrakes to have him sleep with somebody. And it sounds a lot more like the polyamorphous stuff going on today, but eventually they have... 12 children this way. These become, he's the patriarch of the 12 tribes. Eventually, he tells Laban that he wants to go back home. And, and Laban says, well, no, I've 
figured out that I've been blessed because you're here. My flocks have grown a lot since you've been taking care of the sheep. So Laban says, what can I give you to stick around? And Jacob comes up with this clever little plan to separate the gray goats from the dark and speckled ones. And I'm sure anybody that actually knew goat herding here would understand what's going on. But I'm sure like some of them breed better. But they make out a deal where Jacob will take care of the herds, but he'll keep all of the spotted ones or whatever. And wouldn't you know it, Jacob wound up with a flock of strong, healthy ones, and Laban had all of the sickly ones. Then Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all his wealth from what belonged to our father. Jacob also noticed that Laban's attitude was a little worse towards him. And this is when God shows up and says, ah, go back to your homeland now. And Jacob says to Rachel that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages 10 times. But God has protected me by figuring out how to breed the strong ones into my flock. So I haven't stole everything from your dad. I, God gave them to me. And now God is saying that we got to bounce. They sneak off in the middle of the night, and eventually Laban finds out about this, pursues him, and God comes to Laban in a dream and says, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And, you know, it was kind of a mess. One of the daughters had stole the household idols. Long story short, Laban doesn't do anything to him, even though he's got the most men there. But he heeded the warning of the god El Shaddai. On the journey back, he once again comes across the angels. This is just a hangout spot of them, which makes sense because I think that they're just some type of physical beings. But now Jacob has to worry about what Esau's going to do to him because when he fled, he wanted to off him. So he sends a party out front with camels, donkeys, all kinds of stuff as gifts for Esau. They come back and say that Esau's got 100 men with him and Jacob's getting really worried. He divides up all of his stuff and his people into two different camps in case one of them's attacked. And now that his brother may be coming to settle a grudge from 20 years ago, Jacob becomes a man of God and starts praying hard. But just in case God doesn't come through in a pinch here, he doubles down on the livestock for his brother and sends one of his guys ahead with the herd, tells him to lay it on thick, say, you know, your servant Jacob has sent these. And after he had sent everybody ahead, he was left alone, apparently, and some strange man comes out and starts wrestling with him till daybreak. And when this man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched him on the socket of his hip so that his hip was wrenched. Then he said, all right, that's enough. Let me go. It's daybreak. But Jacob says, no, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And he says, what's your name? Jacob. And the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome. He asks the stranger's name again. He says, why do you ask my name? And then it dawns on him that he had wrestled with God. Now, a couple things here. When Yahweh was hanging out with Moses and Moses wanted to see his face, he said, no, you can't see my face because it will kill you. But whoever Jacob was wrestling with, it obviously didn't kill him. Another thing is the name itself means that you have struggled with God and overcome. So you have beaten God. The other thing is he says, it's almost daybreak. Let me go. I got to go. I know I stopped you and wrestled with you all night, but the sun's coming up. I got to go. So this is kind of reminiscent of things that go bump in the night, like the trolls that'll turn to stone if the sun shines on them. Or a vampire. But it is a very curious detail that this the guy that he wrestled with, which is supposed to be God, doesn't want to be caught in the daylight. It has to go. And then there's the thing with him touching him on his hip. And, you know, other translations say his hip went numb. So I don't know if he was implanting a chip into Jacob or what's going on with that. But it's weird. And still to this day, they don't eat the tendon that is attached there. So after being left alone and wrestling with God all night, now all of a sudden he's back with Rachel and Leah and all the kids. Not sure how he caught up so fast with the bum hip. And just to be safe, he puts all the women and kids in between him and Esau, just in case, you know. Then he bowed down seven times and groveled his way towards his brother. And his brother ran up and gave him a big hug and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. 
And they had a good cry, you know, warming family moment here. And Esau looks around and says, who are all these people? And Jacob says, well, they're my family. And he says, well, what about all these flocks? And he says, I, I was sending those to you so you maybe you wouldn't off me. And Esau just says, I have plenty, bro. Uh, you just keep your stuff. I'll keep my stuff. We're good. But then Jacob kept persisting, and finally Esau says, okay, I'll take a few. So after Jacob had stole everything that Esau had coming to him, had stole his blessing, and then gone up north and lived with his uncle and conned him out of all the good sheep in his flock, and then came back to his homeland, and Esau just forgave him for everything. And then when you know he was trying to bribe him with some new flock, he was like, man, I've got plenty. Just don't worry about it. It's just good to see you, bro. You know, almost like a normal family would treat each other, not changing someone's wages 10 different times and marrying them to the wrong daughter through deceit. But Esau is wicked. He's evil demon spawn. And I, 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 I'm I, serious. I listened to preachers talk about this quite a few times before in the past. And uh, where is this coming from? But it's not done yet. Let's finish this story up. One of Esau's clans had violated one of Jacob's daughters. But they say that he loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So I don't know how unconsensual that was. But then he tells his father to try to get her as a wife for him. Well, Jacob and his clan is furious about it. And they're not hearing any of it. And Shechem says, okay, look. Give her to him as a wife, and you're intermarrying with us, and then you're one of us. You settle with us, the land is yours, it's ours, we live and trade, and everything's good. Then he even offers to pay a dowry. Finally, Jacob says, okay, we'll do this on one condition. All of your males become like us and get circumcised. And they say, circumcised, what's that? And they tell him, and they say, chop the end off what now? And I guess they explain that it's a humiliation ritual from this God that Jacob wrestled with all night and gave him a different name. So they hash it out amongst themselves and they say, well, you know, they would make good allies. They got a lot of livestock, yada, yada. And then all of the men agreed to chop their tips. So three days pass and they're still just in crippling pain, trying not to get infected down there. And two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. Yep, they just snuck in while everybody was recovering and started offing people. Then the sons of Jacob came upon the bodies and looted the whole city seizing their flocks and herds and taking everything. Carried off all of their wealth which includes all of their women and children taking as plunder everything in the houses. And I guess in Jacob's defense that he didn't know that his sons were was going to do this because he says, now you've brought trouble on my house. And they just say, well, shouldn't have treated our sister like a prostitute. And for some reason, once again, he comes across God and once again, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. He, he did say that earlier, right? Yep, I just double-checked, and as soon as they were done wrestling, God gave him the name Yisrael. So that is the story of the great patriarch of the 12 tribes. And I hear a lot of people talk about the Abrahamic traditions. These people don't care at all about Abraham or Isaac. They screwed Isaac over. They very proudly trace their lineage back to Jacob and have sworn eternal enmity towards the descendants of Esau. When Jesus came, the Pharisees said that Jesus was the spirit of Esau. And just so you know, the true blues there, they believe in reincarnation. So they believe that Jesus was Esau incarnate once again. And there's a verse about Jesus asking, who do the people say I am? And they say uh, either John the Baptist or Elijah. The letter J wasn't invented until, what, the 14th century or something. So his name definitely wasn't Jesus. And by most accounts, they pretty much just pronounce it Isa. I think the Muslims even just spell it I-S-A. So there's Esau right there, Isa. And part of the Talmudic telling of this story says, Jacob shows his willingness as well as his greater intelligence and forethought. Jacob's eyes is always on the main character. He sees his advantage and takes it, perhaps not believing the foolishness of his despised and despising rival. While what he does is not quite honorable, it's not illegal. 
<laughs> the title he gains is at least partially valid, although he is insecure enough about it to conspire later with his mother to deceive his father once again to get his blessing. So they really make no bones about it. They know that he deceived everybody, Isaac, his brother, everybody. This is not a morality tale. This is not a spirituality tale. It is a tale that says some being decided to take a liar and a thief and make him his boy and bless him and tell him, hey, you're going to have nations bow down to your children. You'll be the most famous man in the world. And, you know, it sounds like a Faustian, Faustian bargain. The god or gods involved in the OT are always offering material, physical, worldly wealth. There is only one mention of any kind of afterlife in the Torah, and it just mentions Sheol, which can be comparable with saying Hades. All the Torah really specifies is a unyielding allegiance to some kind of being that constantly is telling everybody to go just G-side a whole landscape. And then if you can't quite stomach it and you're lenient and let anybody live, well, then Yahweh curses you as well. True story, read the book of Samuel. The worst sin you can possibly commit against Yahweh is to worship another god, which they name by name in the Bible for other cities and nations. And I don't know, it just seems like if it were the true God creator of everything, instead of G-siding everybody, he might just explain to them that, hey, I'm, I'm the real God. But to atone for your sins... God, Yahweh, the true God, wants the exact same thing as all of the lesser gods. He wants you to burn animals to him. So I guess we just figured out the meaning of life. It's to burn animals to Yahweh. So that is the story of Jacob, the patriarch of the 12 tribes, who's a liar and a thief, would have people circumcised and then come back through with swords, conned his uncle out of the best of his flocks, but, you know, his uncle wasn't much better, changed his wages ten times, it just not a good family. And then Esau, who's getting screwed over from birth, and then forgives Jacob after his trespasses, he's the bad guy, he's a villain, he's a demon. This, along with quite a few other things is why I don't think that the father that Jesus was talking about had anything to do with the OT God. And I don't think I'd want to be associated with very many of the people that Yahweh associated with. And I think it's pretty telling that he was trying to get away before the sun came up. So I'll catch you guys on the next one. Static out.